Good morning. My name is John Cloxine, Property Tax Acting Director at the Department of Revenue. On behalf of the Department of Revenue, welcome to our fifth webinar covering property tax legislation enacted in 2017. To those of you that participated in our other webinars, welcome back. For those of you that are joining for the first time, we're glad you are here. On your computer screen, we will be walking through some different information. You may need to periodically wiggle your mouse to avoid the screensaver kicking in. Your microphones should be muted. This will eliminate background noise and help the speaker be heard. Your microphones will remain muted throughout the call, but you can communicate with us at any time using the chat function. Several topics will be covered today. We have included answers to questions you submitted ahead of time whenever possible. At the end of each topic, the presenter will allow some time for you to chat your questions and provide an email address where you can ask additional questions after the webinar. We will allow up to five minute window at the end of each topic so you can send us questions via chat. As the presenter is nearing the end of the topic, they will remind you to submit your questions about that topic. To send us questions or technical issue using chat, click on the green chat icon at the top right of the screen. A chat window will appear on the lower right and you can send us a question. In the box with the label send to, please select host. We will wait about 45 seconds to see if there are questions. If you need more time, please type question coming for us and we will wait, wait longer. We will mute our line while we wait for questions. We will answer as many questions as possible during the five minute window at the end of each topic. If we aren't able to answer your question during the session, it will be addressed in a written Q&A after the session, addressing all the questions about the topic that we can at this time. Again, please chat to let us know if you are having trouble hearing and we will try to adjust. Once again, at the end of the webinar, you will be asked to take a brief survey. Please take a few moments to let us know your thoughts. Your feedback is important and it is used to make the process work better for all of us. The 2017 tax bill contains about 125 provisions that relate to property tax. It was the culmination of proposals worked on in the last three years. Over the next hour, we will share information about several of the 2017 legislative provisions that are already effective or will be soon. Here at Revenue, we have assembled our colleagues who are knowledgeable about the topics presented today. We'll let each individual introduce themselves. My name is Emily Anderson and the supervisor of the Information and Education section. I'm Andrea Fish with Tax Administration and the Property Tax Division as well as the Board of Assessors. Once again, I'm John Cloxeem and I'll be talking about the uh, alternative to meeting the uh, Assessor Accreditation Waiver, uh, which I'll refer to um, Assessor Accreditation as AMA. As an alternative to the requirement that all licensed assessors achieve the accredited Minnesota Assessor License by July 1st, 2022, or within five years of becoming licensed, whichever is sooner, the legislature created a waiver for certain assessors. In order to qualify, eligible assessors must have been licensed as a CMA or CMAS before July 1st, 2004, and have been licensed since that time. A comprehensive examination, substantially equivalent to the requirements for the AMA, must be passed before May 1st, 2020, and the application made to the State Board of Assessors before July 1st, 2022. Please note that the exam may be taken only once. Also, although the waiver is an alternative to achieving the AMA, it does not substitute or serve as an AMA designation. The Department of Revenue has worked with it the Minnesota Association of Assessing Officers and the State Board of Assessors to develop an exam that will be substantially equivalent to the requirements of an AMA. This exam will be completed on paper with a proctor. The exam will be a mix of short answer, multiple choice, and case study questions. It is anticipated that the exam will take at least several hours to complete. The exam will be available this summer and open to take until April 30th, 2020. Details for taking the exam will be sent out to eligible assessors this summer. While there is still a lot of time before the waiver window closes, counties should make those CMA or CMAS assessors aware of their options and the deadlines for completing the AMA or waiver. Also note that as the AMA requirement takes effect in the future, counties should pay attention to the jurisdictional license level list from the State Board to make sure that local jurisdictions follow the rules for license levels when hiring or renewing contracts with assessors in a county. For more information, you can go to the State Board of Assessors website at assessors.board.state.mn.us. 
There were no additional questions submitted prior to the webinar. If you have a question on this topic, please chat them in now. In the send to box, make sure you select host. We'll wait about 45 seconds to see if there are questions. If you need more time than that, chat question coming to let us know you are working on a message and we'll wait a bit longer. We've set aside about five minutes to address all the questions we can, and we'll start with those that are most commonly asked. We'll mute the line until we get questions. Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions on this topic, so we'll move on. Hi again, I'm Andrea Fish, uh, Executive Secretary with the State Board of Assessors, and I am going to talk about changes to the assessor fee schedule. Um, fees for all assessors licenses will increase beginning with licenses effective after June 30th, 2018. These fee increases are necessary to support the administration of the State Board of Assessors. In fact, the board has been operating at a deficit since its budget was first tracked in fiscal year 2012, and fees have not increased since 2003. State law requires that the board be entirely supported by license fees and related record-keeping fees, so the Board of Assessors recommended these fee increases. You'll notice that the fee for educational transcript is removed because assessors will be able to view their own transcripts on our new online licensing system. After rules changes, the record retention fee will no longer be applicable. Finally, you will note that there are new fees for a temporary license and trainee registration, which were not options before. Once again, this is effective for licenses issued after June 30th, 2018. So for assessors, your to-do list is to use the new online licensing system to apply for, renew, or reinstate your license and be mindful of the fee increases. For more information, you can go to the State Board of Assessors website, or if you have questions, contact our email address as shown on the screen. And if you have not been to the Board of Assessors webpage before, it can be accessed from the Department of Revenue homepage under the For Local Governments header. Here you will be able to find information about the board, updates from the board, continuing education requirements, and more. There were no additional questions submitted prior to the webinar, so again, if you have questions on this topic, please chat them in now. In the Send To box, make sure you select Host. We will wait about 45 seconds again to see if there are questions. If you need more time than that, chat Question Coming to let us know that you're working on a message and we'll wait a little bit longer. We've set aside about five minutes again to address all the questions we can, and we'll start with those that are most commonly asked. We are going to mute the line until we get those questions. Thank you. We did receive one question. Um, what if we haven't received our letters yet? Meaning what if you haven't received your login information for the new licensing system? Uh, we sent out the letters um, region by region and the, we're just rolling them out one by one. If you are in region nine, those letters will be going out tomorrow. So hopefully you will get those in the near future. Okay, we've received no further questions, so we will move on to our next presenter. Hi, this is Emily Anderson again, and I will now discuss the two changes that you should be aware of as we move into the County Board of Appeal and Equalization season. As I discuss these changes, I will refer to the County Board of Appeal and Equalization as CBAE. The first change is that the CBAEs are no longer required to send their meeting minutes to the Commissioner of Revenue. In the past, the law required County Assessors to send approved meeting minutes to us within 10 days of the Board adjourning. Now that this is no longer a requirement, we recommend that the county assessor collect the approved minutes and keep them in your, in your records in your office. Another change to the CBAEs is the jurist, the restriction is that they cannot make any valuation or classification changes to a property if the owner has refused the assessor access to the property for an inspection. This can either be an exterior or an interior access of the property. This change places the same restriction on County Board of Appeal and Equalization as the local board has had for a few years. What this means is if a property owner or the representative appeals before the board, the appeal may be heard. However, the board cannot make a change favoring the taxpayer if the assessor has not been allowed to inspect the property. This may be a surprise to some of you because in past years, we have said that even though the county board was not statutorily prohibited from making a change based on the property owner's refusal to allow access to the assessor, we have strongly recommended that the county board not grant any reduction in value until the property owner has allowed the assessor access. If this was already the county board's practice, this may not be a change for them. These law changes are effective with the CBAE meetings held this year. 
Because these are new laws, it is important to explain the changes to the board by reminding them at the start of the meeting they cannot make any evaluation or classification changes benefiting the property owner who refuses access by the assessor. And again, as stated earlier, it is recommended to keep the approved meeting minutes in your records and do not send to the Department of Revenue. You can find the updated information in the fact sheet three titled How to Appeal Your Value and Classification and also in our Property Tax Administrator's Manual, Module 8, Appeals, Equalization, and Correction. We'll have our question and answer session on this topic up next, but if you have any additional questions regarding the changes to the County Board of Appeal and Equalization meetings in the future, please email our Board of Appeal and Equalization email address listed on the screen. There are no questions submitted prior to the webinar on this topic, so if you have your questions on this topic, please chat them in now. We will wait again about 45 seconds to see if there are any questions, and we will mute the line until we get questions. We did receive a question and the question was, is it still required to send the certification of a trained member, which was on February 1st? And that answer is no. That is also a law change recently. And because of our new online system, we are able to see the trained member for each board. All right, and it does not look like we've had any more questions, so we'll move on to the next topic. The Sustainable Forest Incentive Act is also known as SFIA, provides incentive payments to encourage sustainable use of forest lands. Property owners with qualifying lands are eligible to enroll in this program. During this last year, there were a number of changes to Minnesota Statute 290C, which is a statute that covers the SFIA program. As a reminder, this webinar is to discuss the 2017 law changes, so I will provide only a high-level overview of the changes that may either affect you or may be useful in helping educate the landowners in your county. Some of the key changes you should be aware of are that Revenue and the Department of Natural Resources now jointly administer the SFAA program. As before, Revenue handles SFAA applications, payments, and penalties, and DNR will now handle forest management plans, monitoring, and land eligibility. With this change, there is a possibility you may be contacted by either department while they are administering the program. Other key changes include SFA payments rates per acre will increase for most of the current program enrollees. Landowners may choose from now three covenant lengths, either in 8, 20, or 50 years. Payment rates will increase with the covenant length they choose, and until now, only an eight-year covenant was allowed. Enrollees must have a forest management plan registered with the Department of Natural Resources. They were always required to have a plan, however, it must be registered. Penalties have also increased for violating the covenant, including, but not limited to, building a structure or changing the land use. For the past 10 years, the payment rate per acre of SFA land was a flat payment of $7 per acre. Now, as you can see, there are multiple payment rates. The rate depends on the length of covenant and the total number of acres enrolled in SFA. For lands that were enrolled in 2017 and also have a conservation easement on that land, the payment rate will still be $7 per acre and the land is also limited to an eight-year covenant. Like I said, property owners may now choose from an eight, 20, or 50-year covenant length. All land currently enrolled in SFA is still in an eight-year covenant and will remain in an eight-year covenant unless they choose to change it. Current enrollees with land enrolled in 2017 have until May 15, 2019 to choose to change to a 20 or 50 year covenant. So if you talk to current landowners, remind them of this deadline. As with years past, enrollees in the program must certify every year that they are still meeting all SFA requirements for the land enrolled in the program. The certification form will be sent on May 1st to the current landowners. With, these change, with the changes this year, we have also updated the certification form and put it into plain language. Because this may look new to property owners, we will also send a copy to the county and city assessors to have as a resource if they receive questions from property owners. As with the letter that we sent earlier this year, we do tell landowners to contact Revenue, however you may still receive questions. There is a list of multiple things they are certifying on this form. A few of them are, they're certifying that they have not improved the land by adding either a structure, cell tower, billboard, electricity, sewer, campsite, or pavement, and or a road use for purposes that are not included in their forest management plan. 
Also, they're certifying that none of the land is classified as 2C managed forest land and that none of the land is enrolled in any of the other programs, such as reinvest in Minnesota, conservation reservation enhancement program, conservation reserve program, green acres, rural preserve, or agricultural preserves. Though the landowners are certifying they meet these requirements, revenue and or the DNR may contact you to verify your records that you have any property enrolled in the program. Your collaboration with us will help administer the program. It will especially help because there are new penalties that landowners will face if they break the terms of the covenant or do not make, meet the SFA requirements. These penalties are effective immediately. Some of the violations include enrolling land in the programs that are not allowed in combination with SFA, such as managed forest land or green acres, owing delinquent taxes on the land, changing the use of land, such as maybe agricultural, improving the land, such as adding roads, billboards, cell towers, buildings, and or electricity. The penalty depends on the specific violation. At a minimum, they must pay back the SFA payments received plus interest for the number of years the land was in the covenant or for half the length of the covenant, whichever is less. And so now that will be either four, 10, or 25 years. Some examples of the penalties are included in the table. The penalties are significant, and as a way to help remind and educate property owners, we are hoping to reach out to counties as a resource. There are a few different effective dates with the new changes. However, the majority of the changes are effective with the 2018 certifications and applications. As I mentioned, we want to collaborate to ensure the program is, administrative, is administered fairly and equitably. Though the DNR is required to do monitoring of the land enrolled, we also ask you to notify us of any violations you may come across during a quintile or new improvement, of, new improvement reviews. Also, provide this information given to you today to your county recorder's office. They may be seeing an increase of SFA covenants being recorded because we have already had over 100 landowners increase their length of covenants to either a 20 or 50 year covenant length. It was also brought to our attention that the county planning and zoning staff are not aware of land enrolled in SFAA before issuing a permit. When we provide the list of enrollees every year, please forward to the planning and zoning office in your county so they can add SFAA as a part of their checklist for permits. The property tax division does not have these lists available to us, so we appreciate your assistance with sharing this information. We only covered a high level of the changes of the program today. You can find additional and updated information in the Sustainable Forest Incentive Act and SFA Frequently Asked Question Fact Sheets, as well as in our Property Tax Administrator's Manual Module 6, Property Taxation. Cliff Note versions, as well with any of the changes we talked about today, can be found in the 2017 Property Tax Law Summary found on our website. As I referenced earlier, in January, we did forward a letter to county and city assessors that is a helpful resource. This letter was sent to SFAA enrollees and explains the 2017 law changes made to the program. Throughout the letter, we encourage landowners to either contact DNR or us. However, if you get questions from landowners in your county, reference the information in this letter to help. We will have our question and answer session on this topic up next, but if you have any additional questions regarding the changes to the SFA program in the future, visit Revenue and or DNR's website. For information on forest management plans and plan registration, go to the DNR website at the address listed and type SFIA in the search box. For details and fact sheets about the law changes and SFA covenants, payments, or rules, go to Revenue's website and again type SFIA in the search box. Also on the Revenues website, you have the option to sign up for email updates on SFIA. These email updates will be directed to current enrollees. However, you may find it helpful to know that our, what your property owners are receiving on SFIA changes and reminders. To sign up, go to the SFIA page on the Revenue, Revenue website and click the subscribe to SFIA updates link, which is the red envelope you see on the screen right now. If you still have questions, email our SFA administrator at the address listed below. There were no questions regarding the 2017 law changes submitted prior to the webinar. If you have questions on this topic, please chat them in now, and we will again wait 45 seconds to see if there are questions, and we will mute the line while we wait. Okay, we did receive a few questions on this topic, so I'll read the question and answer. 
So the first question is, will the payback amounts increase with a longer program? And the payback amount of penalty depends on the covenant length. So yes, the covenant length has increased from an eight year to either a eight, 20, or 50. Um, and it is dependent on the year in the, or how many years they've been enrolled in the program as well. The next question is if someone is currently in 2C and want to switch to SFAA, when does the 2C need to be removed? And so if they want to SFA for 2019, would 2C go away for assessment 2018? They may not be enrolled in 2C at the time of application. Applications for SFA are due October 31st, 2018 in order to receive their payment in 2019. So at the time of application on October 31st, 2018, they may not be enrolled in 2C. The next question is that they, you as county assessors used to receive a email list of who is enrolled in the program and they are asking if this will still happen or will it be found on our website. You will still receive a email list from Julie, um, our state program administrator of the SFA program of the current enrollees and we ask that you verify those enrollees with your records as well. That wraps up our question and answer session on this topic and we will now move on. Uh, this wraps up our webinar for today. If you have questions about the provisions discussed today, please send them to us using the property tax contact information listed on the screen. This webinar will be made available online for your future reference and for those who did not attend today. The questions you submitted during the webinar will be summarized, answered, and also posted to our property tax law summary page. You can also find more information about these provisions and others in the law summary. Use keyword search 2017 property tax law summary. Our priorities for preparing memos and other clarifying information are being driven by an effective date. We will communicate about other provisions as we near their effective date or the time when you or revenue need to take some action. At the end of this webinar, a very short survey will automatically open. If you can, please take time to share any feedback you have about this webinar or topics you'd like us to cover. We will also ask questions about whether you would like to see future uh, webinars, including any webinars that might be uh, included with a uh, changes to taxes that might be occur in 2018. Thank you to all who participated. Please let us know how this worked for you by completing the survey. This concludes our webinar for today.